brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that sends 5% of your monthly plan price to your favorite charity. No contracts, nationwide coverage, risk-free guarantee. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. June is the month of the Sacred Heart. It is the month on the liturgical calendar where we focus on our Lord's burning love for us and what his sacrifice meant. As Catholics, we should always be thinking about what the sacrifice of Christ meant for us and how he is truly alive with the Father. I have for you today Monsignor Ronald Knox and his thoughts on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I think this is especially timely for us again because while Catholics should be dedicated to humility and thinking of our Lord and his sacrifice on the cross and his burning love for us, the world has some very different things it's celebrating right now. Some very disordered, unnatural things being celebrated now that are quite the opposite of the Sacred Heart and, hum and humble submission to our blessed Lord. So here's Monsignor Ronald Knox on the Heart of Christ. Rather more than 300 years ago, a book came out in London under the title The Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth, or A Treatise Demonstrating the Gracious Disposition and Tender Affection of Christ in His Human Nature, Now in Glory, Unto His Members, Under All Sorts of Infirmities, Either of Sin or Misery. You would have made certain, after reading so much, that it had been produced by one of that little brand of exiles who practiced the old religion overseas and smuggled in books as best they could, by way of keeping it alive here in England. You would have been wrong. It was written by Thomas Goodwin, a distinguished Congregationalist minister who attended Oliver Cromwell on his deathbed. You may read more, if you will, about that very remarkable man in Mr. Watkins' book, Poets and Mystics. I only mention it here to show that devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, commonly thought of as a popish superstition from the middle of the 17th century, is in fact a form of piety which can commend itself to all Christians. And yet, when some visitor not of our faith comes into a church like this in the month of June, he is commonly repelled by the statue he sees at the end of the nave, opposite the Madonna, marked out in this time of the year, by flowers set around it and candles burning in front of it, not just because of the flowers and the candles, not just because of the statue itself, though that is often enough executed in poor taste, the features insipid, the mark of the wound and the pierced side crudely realistic. No, it's a whole history of the thing that makes no appeal to him. A nun having a vision about our Lord showing her the wound and talking about the heart which loves so much and is loved so little in return. What is this but sentimentalism, and a kind of sentimentalism which we despise even among our fellow men? After all, is there any position more undignified than that of the rejected lover who cannot keep the thing to himself but must needs go about exposing his wounded feelings for all the world to see, inviting our sympathy because he is unloved? Yet that is the figure under which the divine love represents itself in the devotion of the Sacred Heart. But remember that this is the language in which all through the Old Testament Almighty God refers to the apostasies of our so-called elder brothers. The covenant which he made with the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt was a kind of marriage contract, engaging both sides to fidelity, and when they turn to the worship of idolatrous gods, he appeals to it. And thou, he says through Jeremiah, and thou with many lovers hast played the wanton. Come back to me, and thou shalt find welcome. This is pleading language, and it is a God who pleads. As we know, when the Old Testament talks like that, it is using a metaphor. The Old Testament is full of metaphors. When it talks about God raising his hand, stretching out his arm, and keeping a watchful eye over his friends, giving a ready ear to their prayers, we are not to suppose that he, who is pure spirit, has hands or arms or eyes or ears like ourselves, and so it is when he describes himself as a jealous lover. He means that if he were a man like ourselves, this is how the infidelity of his friends would affect him. If he were a man, and then in the fullness of time, he did become a man like ourselves. He trod our earth and was subject as man to the play of emotions, wept and rejoiced, was indignant and felt fear. The metaphors had come true at last. God incarnate really saw with human eyes, stretched out a human hand to save. And he was accessible, like ourselves, to those gusts of feelings which we find it so difficult to control. 
Jesus looking round about on them with anger. When an injury was done to the honor of his Father in heaven, he flared up. At that time, Jesus was filled with gladness. The success of his first missionaries gave him the same feeling which comes to you and me when good news reaches us. Jesus wept. The tragedy of a friend's death drew from him its tribute of natural tears. And he did not hide from us his disappointments. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, still slaying the prophets and stoning the messengers that are sent to thee. How often have I been ready to gather thy children together, and thou didst refuse it. How often? He looks back over the sad record of their history. The authentic accents of a divine person pierced through the veil of his humanity. Here is God, weeping with human eyes over the pent-up sorrows of a human heart. And that is the real meaning of the Sacred Heart Devotion. It translates the divine nature into human terms for us. When all is said and done, we find it hard, don't we, to get God into our mind picture. His glory dazzles us. We are confused by the thought of the enormous gulf which lies between him and his creatures. We know that his providence extends over all his works. He caters even for the sparrows. And yet, he is so great and we are so small. Even our sins, just an unkind word said about a neighbor, and we tell ourselves that we have offended God. Think of the scale of the thing, our little lapse in his infinite existence, but side by side. And then we think of the sacred heart, and all at once the thing becomes vivid to us. Jesus Christ in heaven, taking an interest in our tiny needs, as he took an interest in so many tiny needs on earth. Jesus Christ, hurt by our sins, as he was hurt by so many slights and disappointments up and down the villages of Galilee. The echoes of our prayer no longer seem to die away in infinite distance. They strike a chord in the sacred heart and become vocal to us, real to us. And if our critics still object that we are too sentimental over our devotions in this month of June, that we single out one particular side of our Lord's character, represent him too insistently in one particular attitude, one of mercy and tenderness and welcome, let us remind them that it is just these qualities in the divine nature which we find it most difficult to believe in. Here, most of all, we need a diagram in flesh and blood to convince us. How can God, so upright a judge, be merciful? How can he who is without comp who is without passion be tender to save us? How can he who has no need of human companionship welcome us? It is these qualities that we rejoice to see mirrored in the sacred heart. But that is not all. The statues, the holy pictures, represent our Lord in one particular attitude, as he revealed himself to Sister M Margaret Mary. An attitude of tender ab abasement, of mouth mournful pleading with, with mankind. And, as I say, people from outside who come into our churches look at it and are scandalized. Is this all your Christ, they ask, this weak womanish figure in a posture of sentimental appeal? Is religion all sugary sweetness, all variations on a minor key? Has it stopped still with the 17th century? Has it no message for today? And to that we answer, no, you have got it all wrong. The sacred heart is the treasury of all those splendid qualities with which a perfect life was lived, it is the repository of all those noble thoughts which mankind still venerate in the Gospels. It was the sacred heart that burned with anger when the traitors were driven out of the temple. It was the sacred heart that loved the rich young man, yet would not spare him. It was the sacred heart that defied Pilate in his own judgment hall. It is strong and stern and enduring. It hates prevarications and pretenses. The perfect flowering of a human life. Not on this occasion or that, but all through, all the time, the other sacrifice of human will. That is what the sacred heart means, and there is no picture, no statue on earth that can betray its infinite beauty. That was Monsignor Ronald Knox on the devotion to the sacred heart and what the real meaning of the sacred heart is. Everything our Lord did, all of his love for us, flows from the sacred heart. Perhaps something you can meditate on today, on your way to or from Mass, if you will. Knowing all that, does that put more meaning, greater like impact on the water and blood that flowed from the sight of Christ when he was pierced by the lance of the Roman centurion? Curious what you think of this. So let me know in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help as this sharing this on social media. That helps too. So let's pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.